This week, we discover that the writers of Mr. Terrific have been watching episodes of Captain Nice because they're copying the plot about a Middle Eastern dignitary visiting the U.S. and being in danger, so our hero has to save him. Hey, as we've said before, imitation is the sincerest form of plagiarism. Let's take a look. The Sultan of Ramzar has just arrived in this country for a visit, which includes a complete physical examination by our leading doctors. Incidentally, the Sultan is not alone. He's accompanied by his five, yes, that's right, five lovely wives. You might remember that other guy offered one of his women to Carter Nash in exchange for Sergeant Kane. If this guy ends up offering one of his wives to Stanley in exchange for Hal, I'm changing the channel early. Excuse me, Sultan. Is it true every year your country presents you with your weight in diamonds? Correct. But this year, to help the struggling economy of my little nation, I have lost ten pounds. <laughs> How very noble. His weight in diamonds? What does he need all that for? I mean, I know he has five wives, and wives are expensive, but they don't exactly look like the type that'll go out on an exorbitant shopping spree at a moment's notice either. So again, what does he need all that wealth for? What does he do with all those diamonds once they give them to him? If I'm visiting him and I accidentally open his hall closet, am I going to drown in a sea of diamonds pouring out of it? I am really overanalyzing this thing, aren't I? Let's move on to the key plot element. We understand you expect to have a complete physical checkup while in Washington. Yes. Excuse me. Those men, who are they? Secret Service. Dismiss them. I have no bodyguards while in my own country, and I refuse to have any while in yours. As expected, Reed gets a call from the State Department. They want secret projects to keep an eye on the Sultan because they're afraid of a kidnapping attempt. By whom, they don't say. Maybe the list of potentials is long enough to take up the whole episode, who knows. Anyway, we know what secret project means. Oh, not Mr. Terrific, BJ. Yes, Mr. Terrific. This calls for action. A-C-T-I-O-N, action. I changed my mind. If I have to watch that every episode, then so do you. Reed and Trent appear at the gas station disguised as mailmen and give Stanley his assignment. He's undercover as the Sultan's social secretary, but his real job is to keep an eye on the Sultan and make sure he's safe. And here are your power pills. The one-hour pill and the two ten-minute boosters. But don't take it... Don't... Stanley, no! He was only supposed to do that in an emergency. And I have one small problem with that scene. Doesn't he usually have to take the big one with water? Since when can he just pop it like that? In any case, now that he's taken it, they decide he may as well fly over to the hotel and get started. Stanley says, fine, let me tell Hal I'm leaving. Hal, I've decided to take the rest of the day off after all. Oh, great, Stan. Listen, would you take the car off the jack before you leave? Okay. <laughs> hey, did you see... No, no. <laughs> Never mind. Those are some of the better gags in the show, mainly because Dick Gautier sells them. His reactions are so perfect, I can believe what's happening long enough to enjoy the joke. I do laugh every time I see one of those. The problem with the show was, it had lots of little moments that work like that one, but nothing that could really be called a big one. The overall plot as it's unfolded just doesn't sell itself. I think part of the reason for that is what we've discussed before. We're so mission-oriented, we forget that these are supposed to be real people, and the audience wants to get to know them. A lot of things come together to make this scene work. Hal already had to help Stanley jack the car up because Stanley was too weak to operate the jack. Now Stanley just casually saunters over and picks the whole car up. Hal watched it happen, but he knows his lifelong friend Stanley, and Stanley can't do that. So he must have imagined the whole thing. He's more inclined to believe what he's known about his best friend for his whole life than to believe what he just saw with his own eyes. That tells us a lot about Hal and his attitude towards Stanley. So not only are we getting a joke that goes about as smoothly as a joke ever did, we learn some important things about Hal as a person and as a friend. When you get right down to it, Hal is the only character we really know a lot about. We know he's a superficial ladies' man, but he does have a certain depth. We see it in his relationship with Stanley. He's super protective of Stanley and obviously loves him like a brother. He's always trying to mentor Stanley in the fine art of seduction, with the kind of results you'd expect in this show. 
but his devotion to Stanley even overrides his overactive glands, so if it comes down to a choice between a date with a beautiful woman and Stanley needing him for something, Stanley will win every time. There's a lot more to Hal than what appears on the surface and we catch frequent glimpses of it. I wish I could say that about all the characters, but even Stanley isn't developed to that degree. Instead of making him a complete, wholly rounded person, the show focuses on the contrast between when he's a weakling and when he's super strong. You can only go so far with that, and they did. Does Stanley have any family? Are his parents alive? Does he have siblings? How did he end up where he is? What was his home life like? What factors shaped him into who he is today? We get nothing. He remains two-dimensional, and I suspect that's a big part of what killed the show. You can only beat people over the head with a plot so many times before they get wise to what you're doing. Excuse me, uh, are you the Sultan of Ramsar? Do I look like the Sultan of Ramsar? Unfortunately, 709 is occupied by the bad guys who are trying to find out what room the Sultan is in. Wait a minute. You have uh, something for the Sultan? Uh, yes, ma'am. Me. <laughs> well, I guess I'm in the wrong room. Uh, and if he's not here, he must be in, in 907. Oh. <laughs> and now they know. Stanley meets the Sultan and immediately starts forgetting he has super strength. <laughs> then the bad guys come to the door to kidnap the Sultan. When your gun barrel's made of clay, that can happen. Try steel next time. Now that that's out of the way, Stanley goes back to breaking stuff. Dear Under Secretary of State. Uh, I have a very nice handwriting. The Sultan basically says, that's it, you're fired. Stanley protests that he promised Mr. Reed, but the Sultan has had enough. That's perfectly all right, my boy. I'll take care of everything. Uh, but, uh... I... Here, to show you there are no hard feelings. Take one of my wives. Number four, the one that giggles. At least he didn't ask for Hal. Stanley reports to Reed. The Sultan gave Stanley a wife. He fired him and, and he, he gave him one of those... Uh, uh, BJ, I, I think I could probably handle that secretary job. Look at that! Trent got a good line where he wasn't the fall guy. That doesn't happen often enough. If we had more of that, he might become a real boy. It is possible to be both a real person and the fall guy. And we just learned something interesting about Trent. He has a And unlike Stanley, he knows what... Well, this is the first time for everything, Stanley. Now you just simply take her home for now. Take her home? <laughs> Please do what I say. Go home and await further instructions. Well, how will I ever explain that to Hal? <laughs> I'm sure Hal would be glad to take her off your hands. No questions asked. I'm not going to say anything about the obvious treatment of women as objects and all that, because it's so overdone it's impossible to take it seriously. The wives are actually named wife number one, wife number two, and so on. I have to wonder if they did that because they couldn't think of any Arab-sounding women's names. Then again, they could have gone with anything and gone with it. They named the country Ramsar, which sounds like a dinosaur transformer, so it's not like they were trying very hard. And besides, at the apartment we learn that she really does have a name. Uh, this is my apartment. Of course, it's, it's not as nice as what you're accustomed to. Wherever you are, it is nice for Bonby. Oh. <laughs> her name is Bonby, and her sole purpose is to make Stanley happy. Oh, Hal. Hal, I'm, I'm home. Oh, hi. Do you mean the girls? Uh, well, in a kind of way. Uh, well, thank you very much. Good, good. You make a date? Uh, well, I, I don't know if you'd exactly call it a date. Hey, Stanley. What did you mean when you s Oh, hi, Hal. Uh, this is Bonby. <laughs> hi, Bonby. Meanwhile, the bad guys have pulled up to City Hospital disguised as an ambulance crew because the Sultan is getting a complete physical at the hospital later today. I have a hunch, Harleen. It worries me. I think we ought to get Stanley over here to the hospital right away. I have a hunch, too, BJ, that says we shouldn't. Need I remind you, Harley, that as your superior, my hunch should take precedence over your hunch? I had a hunch you'd say that. I threw that in because it's a good example of how the right delivery can breathe new life into an old gag. The deadpan back and forth, 
finishing with Paul Smith's flat, casual last line, almost as if he's treating it as a throwaway when it's the punchline, it all works. Every so often you find a gem among the droppings. Even here. Have you got any money? Yeah. <laughs> the expression says it all. Two in a row. I do enjoy the way these two play off each other. Hello? Hello, Stanley. Oh, hi, Mr. Reed. Poor Stanley seems to have reluctantly accepted his lot in life. Reed tells him to take a cab to the hospital and protect the Sultan. Why doesn't that one work? Because he has no reason to suspect that those might be the kidnappers or that that might be the Sultan on the stretcher. The two guys' faces are covered and he only saw them for an instant at the Sultan's door. And he doesn't even know there's a woman involved, so that lowers his suspicion meter even more. In the same situation, any of us would have either done the same thing or ignored the scene entirely. Basically, they gave us a punchline with no setup. Those rarely work, and by rarely I mean never. Well, predictably, Reed and Trent burst out the door and tell him that ambulance just kidnapped the Sultan, take a booster pill and go after them. And hurry, there's only five minutes of airtime left, and that includes the credits. But not too quickly, because five minutes can be a lot of air time, so don't disable their engine yet. Look! Another one! <laughs> oh no, my power's going off. And besides, we haven't done that joke yet. He has another booster in his pocket, so he takes it and powers up again, just as the villains are transferring the Sultan to a boat. Navnik, here comes another one. Downstairs. You may have to check a little further downstairs than that. When Stanley hit the water, that guy fired six shots at him. I've been waiting to see if he had one of Doc Holliday's patented 12 shooters. Nope, six shots and he's done. I was very happy to see that. Stanley throws him into the water, then waits for the other one. At another one! Come on, fight like a man! But, but you are like no other man I've ever known! Oh no. That strange signal. Uh, uh, yeah, nothing. You know, uh, on second thought, I have an idea. Uh, why don't uh, we talk things over like, uh, like civilized people? This still bugs me. He has this guy on the ropes. His power went off, yes, but the bad guy doesn't know that. He has no idea what that buzzer means. All Stanley has to do is bluff a little and the guy will give up without a fight. But every time it happens, Stanley has to make it obvious to the other guy that something is wrong. This is a good example of where we could grow the character a little. Have Reed get him some training and bluffing his way through when his power goes off and put him in a situation where it works. Suddenly we have a new dimension to Stanley. But it just never happens. All the focus is on the mission and the gags. It's a shame. It'd be fun to see a remake that did it right because the premise really does have possibilities. It might be nice to see some of them finally get realized. The bad guy comes at Stanley with a knife and Stanley actually does something smart. On purpose. <laughs> At least I think it was on purpose. He unties the Sultan. I'll have you untied in just a jiffy, uh, your greatness. Mr. Beamish, how can I ever repay you? Uh, well, there is one way. You know that wife you gave me, the, the one who giggles? Uh, well, now, as much as I like her, I... Of course. 
I'll give you two wives. Stanley has got to learn to talk faster. Reed is able to talk the Sultan into taking them back, and things are back to normal at the station. I'm a little puzzled that they never caught the woman spy. She drove away in the ambulance while the two guys were moving the Sultan to the boat, and we never heard about her again. I expected something to the effect that Reed and Trent caught her as they were heading to the boat dock or something, but it didn't happen. That makes me wonder if she's going to be back or if we have more sloppy writing. Before we find out, we need to turn the dial over to Channel 3 and NBC for Captain Nice. Carter is working late on some important evidence, but he can't get anything done because a new club has moved in next door, and their music is so loud it's shaking his basement walls, knocking test tube racks over, and generally acting like a small earthquake. I have got to hear the kind of music that can do that. That's it. Basic swing. If Carter is in that room with the music and his ears aren't bleeding, it's not the music that's causing the problem. He asks for the boss, and while he's waiting, he gets to play straight man for a bit. I came here early so I could get a seat. That was wise. Well, Happy New Year! New Year? It's the middle of March. I told you, I got here early. <laughs> He meets Lola, and she says she's been having trouble with the volume control. She invites him to have a drink. Since he doesn't drink alcohol, she offers him a fruit punch. Meanwhile, we see what's really vibrating the walls. What's wrong? Oh, there's a creep out front from the police station. He works in the lab, and he says the vibrations are breaking his test tubes. You think he's wise digging a tunnel in the jail? I w wonder w w why he t t talks like that. No, no, not yet. He thinks the music's causing the vibrations, but I don't know. I think we better knock off the drilling for the night. We gotta keep drilling if we expect to break through into Doc's cell for tomorrow night. You know, once they move him from the local jail into state pen, we'll never get a chance to spring him. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Okay, keep going. But what, what do you do about... Don't worry, I'll make sure he doesn't get back to his lab tonight. Wait, that's not Lola. That's Dolly, Fingers' girlfriend from Mr. Terrific. Her real name is Barbara Stewart, and we'll see her again in Adamania when Batman and Robin face the puzzler. Well, of course, the fruit punch is drugged, and she has her hat check girl take a picture of Carter passed out in the gutter. The next morning, it's on the front page of the paper, along with some rather unflattering comments about the police department. Mayor Uncle Fred is incensed. I haven't seen headlines as vicious as this since I was elected. Carter was supposed to be working on some important evidence for Chief Zegel. What is it? Evidence that will give me conclusive proof that Judge Forster is tied up with the Doc Simmons mob. You're crazy. Well, that's what Judge Forster said. A crooked judge. Good goal. Carter is supposed to be trying to find the judge's fingerprints on some cash they got hold of. If he can find some, it'll implicate the judge. The judge himself is leaving for South America the next morning, so Carter has to get the evidence before he departs, or he'll likely stay there where they can't touch him. See to it that Carter doesn't leave that lab until he's finished with them. Right. Sergeant Kane? I'm assigning you to desk duty at the station tonight. Yes, sir. Carter is not to leave here under any circumstances until those tests are completed. Yes, sir. And if you have to stop him bodily, do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Carter tries to explain to his mother that he did not go out drinking last night, but he doesn't have time to elaborate. He has to get to the lab and finish the experiment. That's your son in that picture, lying flat on his back in the gutter. What do you think of that? He's certainly grown up to be a fine-looking boy. <laughs> Lola's man has reached the wall of the cell. They've been getting rid of the dirt by putting it in bags and tossing it out with the garbage. He gives her the last of it. She says break through in an hour when only the desk sergeant will be on duty. Isn't Sergeant Kane supposed to be keeping him from doing that? Where is she? Why didn't she stop him bodily like the chief told her to? She seemed really interested in doing that. Speak to Miss Lola, please. Hey, sit down, Charlie. I I'll buy you a drink. Time to play straight man again while he waits. I am not the least bit interested in having a drink or even conversing with you. In my opinion, you're a failure as a person and a shameful, pathetic product of the human race. That's a relief. I thought I was becoming a drunk. <laughs> I kind of like this guy. Earlier, he gave us this one. Could you teach me 
me that step? Drunks aren't funny anymore. <laughs> Get real, this guy is hilarious. Lola offers Carter a drink again and he refuses. He insists this time he has to get back to work. Oh, oh, oh please. Are you warm? I feel faint. The old fainting trick. Every guy in the world falls for it every time. Would you help me over to the bar? Oh, oh. Uh, quick, a glass of water. Oh, please don't leave me. I'll be all right in just a moment. Now, you, oh. you just relax. Oh. Isn't that water for her? How is putting her to sleep going to keep him there? Oh. 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 Thank you, Monty. Oh, this water tastes funny. Really? It tastes fine to me. Oh, that's how. She gets him to drink enough to turn him to jelly again, and he staggers out of the place. Through the haze, he starts to put it together. Just then, the digger breaks through the wall of the big boss's cell. That's it. Jailbreak. Of course, this is a job for Carter's alter ego, Captain Nice. He'll spring into action if he can stay awake long enough to get the formula out of his briefcase. Just as Doc and Moe are getting ready to exit the cell, a complication appears. What's that noise? Now what's going on in here? Hold it right there, copper. Too bad you had to hear. Wait a minute, Moe, wait a minute. A shot will only bring on more cops. We'll take her along. She'll only slow us up. We're better off killing her. I say we take her along. I agree with him. So do I. She's way too cute to shoot. Shut up. You can't be objective. We kill her. Will you cut it out? We haven't got time to argue. Then it's compromise. We'll kill her and take her along. <laughs> Say, will you? He'll be our protection. Get it here. Right there, honey. Go into the tunnel. Just to make sure we're not followed. Carter drinks his formula and turns into Captain Nice. Unfortunately, he's still under the influence of Lola's drug. <laughs> Who's tilting the room? <laughs> he starts staggering around and destroying stuff. He even brings down a piece of ceiling that blocks the door. Lola has seen enough. Honey, our only chance is through the tunnel. We'll have to shoot our way through the police station. Now I'll head off, Doc, and you stall Captain Nice, okay? The rest of the patrons realize the door is blocked and start looking for another way out. <laughs> you can guess what that cell looks like now. Monty is the last one out. I half expect him to eat it. Wish you could remember what I came in here for. No, he used it to seal the tunnel behind everybody so all those people are trapped in the cell. Because the bad guys forgot one little thing. Finally, Carter finishes his experiment on that $1,000 bill. Are Judge Foster's fingerprints on that $1,000 bill? They certainly are. Good! And so are yours, Mayor Finney's, the District Attorney's, Commissioner Kelly's, Superintendent Watkins, and 73 others that I have not yet been able to identify. It sounds like they were playing hot potato with it. <laughs> well, at least we've still got Doc Simmons safely locked away. Who? Simmons, Simmons. <laughs> you checked him out about a minute ago. <laughs> He was supposed to be moving to the state pen to serve a 99-year sentence. Please tell me that's where you checked him out to. No, after all that, the chief absentmindedly let him walk. End of episode. It was nice to see Candy featured more in this one. I still wonder how Carter got past her so easily. She had one job, and best we can tell, she didn't do it. And shenanigans ensue. Overall, I enjoyed both episodes. 
But once again, we see Captain Nice taking a little time for character development, whereas Mr. Terrific feels that time with scenes of Stanley flying or something else equally unnecessary. Even so, it was a good story with good pacing and some really good jokes. Captain Nice took the reins off William Daniels a little and let him play, and he did an excellent job. And in all the chaos of Carter getting smashed in a jailbreak attempt, Mayor Uncle Fred forgot to do his I asked you not to tell me that joke. That alone makes the episode worth watching. Until next time.